Hello Warfighters, War is Hell, welcome to the next episode of things that I've been learning in my own military research as part of my formal education. Uh, today we're going to be looking at how would the Soviet Union have employed nuclear weapons and what's cool is we're going to be looking at this entirely from their perspective. The two sources that we're going to be using primarily for this episode is the book Soviet Military Strategy in Europe by Joseph D. Douglas Jr. If you're looking to purchase that book, you can find a link to it in the description below. And also the book Getting Mad at Nuclear Mutual Assured Destruction, Its Origins and Practice. Now we're looking particularly at Chapter 5, which was written by John A. Batalega, which outlines some of the work done by John Hines, who interviewed a number of Soviets after the end of the Cold War. If you guys can help out support me in this project that I'm doing in future videos, uh, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks to everybody who has thus far. If you can spare a few dollars, down in the description below is a link to the Patreon. That's gonna go help cover things like books, tuition, crazy fees that I have to pay, and uh, getting access to some resources to kind of continue doing some of these videos. So your guys' financial contribution is greatly appreciated, and I feel like it goes to a good source goes to my education. But let's go ahead and get to this episode. So I found this particular quote in the book Soviet Military Strategy in Europe by Joseph D. Douglas Jr. very, very interesting. This really gives you some insight on how the Soviet Union would plan on using, uh, to some degree, their nuclear weapons. It says the frontline ground troops in conjunction with frontal aviation and with the fleet in coastal regions, using the results of strikes by Soviet rocket troops, long-range avia long aviation, and rocket-carrying submarines against objectives and enemy, gr uh, enemy groups in the theater of military operations, will destroy the remaining group of enemy troops, occupy enemy territory, and protect their own territory. That's very informative because it lets you see the role that they thought conventional troops would play in conjunction with their nuclear forces. In many ways, the Soviet Union saw nuclear weapons as a much more efficient way of fighting war. Rather than a war being determined by a series of smaller engagements that over time culminated into who was uh, victorious and who ended up losing the war, nuclear warfare just provided a quick and absolute result to the engagement, and it was instantaneous too. At the same time, if the Soviets had an objective, like let's say they had to take a position uh, eliminate NATO forces, whatever it may be, this particular action could take a substantial amount of supplies, men, and time to complete. But in the thought of a lot of Soviet military leaders, why do this when a nuclear weapon could do the same job almost instantaneously? Uh, this was something that appealed, of course, to a lot of people in the Soviet general staff because they wouldn't have to invest so much in a large-scale battle. Tactics did have to change to meet the new tactics brought about by nuclear weapons in the Soviet Union. For example, uh, troop concentrations had to change significantly. If you think about it, one would have to really mass their troops in a particular area to take an important position. And by massing these troops together against an opponent who had a nuclear or who had nuclear weapons of their own, you're, you're basically inviting your own destruction right there, and you make yourself a pretty nice target. Force concentration and movement really changed under Soviet tactics, especially after 1963. One particular area of nuclear tactics that was specifically outlined by the Soviets was how nuclear weapons would be used as a means of supporting troops on the ground. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, they wouldn't. <laughs> it, it contrasted heavily with the purposes of artillery and fire support. For example, with artillery, it can be used as a means to suppress troops, uh, to slow down the advance of enemy forces, or soften up defenses for a larger attack. Uh, artillery during the Cold War was a lot more inaccurate than it is now. I think that's important to kind of note here too, but with nuclear weapons, they could destroy their target with a near guarantee of success. Uh, as we read in the first quote there, it was really going to be conventional forces that were going to be mopping up after a nuclear attack. So there really wasn't a need for nuclear weapons to support uh, the ground forces. Now this is what the Soviets thought of the employment of nuclear weapons on the battlefield, and this comes from the offensive by Sidorenko. Uh, it says, The destructive effort of nuclear weapons and their capability to inflict complete destruction on the enemy within a specific radius go beyond the framework of former impressions about the fire of conventional means of destruction. 
Nuclear weapons do not assure and they do not support the motorized rifle and tank units, but accomplish missions for the destruction of the enemy independently. Now, this is not to be confused, though, with the role that tactical nuclear weapons would play on the battlefield. This was something that the Soviets and the U.S. really developed and sought to employ. The U.S. specifically felt that tactical nuclear weapons would be critical to counter the sheer volume of tanks the Soviet Union possessed. Like the U.S., the Soviets did see the value of these smaller nuclear weapons and came up with different models on how to use them from about 1975 onward. As we talked about in a previous episode, the Soviets wanted a fully offensive approach, and the implementation of nuclear weapons in their mind furthered the need to be offensive. Now, this is a quote that came from New Weapons and the Art of War in 1970. It says, Nuclear weapons have increasingly confirmed the role of attack as the decisive form of military action, and have given rise to the necessity of resolving even defensive tasks by offensive action. Now this is important because some of Dr. Heinz's research really solidified the understanding that the Soviet Union believed that the US would strike first. As we've learned in the previous episode, the idea of a preemptive attack was a very key point of Soviet strategy. The idea that the employment of nuclear weapons in a preemptive attack really came from the early days of the Soviet Union, particularly with what happened during World War II and the quote, great German betrayal, close quote, that we know as Operation Barbarossa. Now, one thing that's important to note for those of us who are Americans is as horrible as Pearl Harbor was and as much as it is ingrained into our national memory, uh, it is very easy to be able to say that Operation Barbarossa was much worse for the Soviet Union. I'm not trying to devalue the importance of Pearl Harbor, but I think that is important to note that as much as Pearl Harbor meant to the United States, what happened during Operation Barbarossa to the Soviet Union is deeper ingrained into their national memory. The Soviets promised that they would never allow something like that to happen again. But this fear of a first strike went so far that the Soviet Union uh, would look for clues that would verify what they believed. For example, one clue that the Soviet Union believed that they could use to really solidify their understanding that the Americans would strike first was by taking a look at U.S. nuclear silos. What they found out was that these nuclear silos were not as hardened as their own. And so in their minds, the Soviet Union thought the U.S. wouldn't harden them as much because if the United States struck first, those silos would be clear and a counter-strike wouldn't hit anything inside of those silos. Now, another aspect where we see that the Soviet Union was really looking to get an advantage here as well. In addition to having the option for a preemptive strike was really to try and use technology. Aspects where technology had changed with nuclear weapons was with the use of computers specifically. Stalin initially didn't like the idea of computers to solve technical problems following uh, World War II. It was really under Khrushchev that uh, computers became a critical component to the Soviet nuclear arsenal and their overall war fighting ability. In retrospect, the acceptance of computers proved critical and really helped the Soviets uh, make the nuclear revolution what it was and also included bringing more science and technology to the battlefield. Now, this quote comes from Decision Making and Automation, Concept Algorithm Division in 1972. It says, it is not a simple thing for the military commander to analyze an abundance of facts. The volume of information that staffs must process has increased many fold since World War II, and the time allowed for decision making has decreased many fold. As a result, the requirement on the brain capacity of commanders and staff have increased vastly. To meet these requirements by simply expanding the administrative apparatus is fundamentally impossible, since this would require an, in, an inordinate increase in the number of headquarters. Organization of efficient operation within such vast management offices would become a very difficult task. The only escape from the incompatible situation lies in the extensive application of automation, primarily computers. As time progressed, large-scale modeling, research, missile guidance systems, targeting systems, autopilot, and other important areas of technological development were on par with what the West was producing. The Soviet Union wanted dominance in all matters of warfare, and soon computers would become a part of that. The idea with computers is that being not only more efficient would be helpful with processing and analyzing data, but with automation, there was a higher chance 
of hitting back at NATO, even if there was a catastrophic attack that took out a number of critical Soviet individuals. So hopefully that gives you some insight on how the Soviet Union planned to employ nuclear weapons. As you've noticed from some of the videos that we've had previous to this, uh, nuclear weapons are definitely a critical part of Soviet military thinking. And we'll definitely be discussing it a lot more, but I thought that there were some very interesting things in here uh, that kind of provided some insight into what the Soviets were thinking about how they would employ nuclear weapons and also give you uh, some good insight on how they came to those decisions as well. So that is going to be it here for this episode. I am going to be moving these to just be on Mondays. Uh, so there are going to be more of these videos to come later on. So like the video if you enjoyed what you saw. And if you learned something, make sure you comment down below and tell me something that you may not have known. Make sure you subscribe for more of these videos. Again, I'm going to try to do them every single Monday. Uh, of course, real life gets in the way of that, but I will try as hard as I can. And there's other videos too that you guys might enjoy on here as well. We do have a great Discord. We'd love to have you be a part of that. That is in the description below. Again, as well as the link to Patreon if you are so inclined to help support uh, what I'm doing here financially. Thanks for watching, you guys. I appreciate it. War is hell. You don't have to worry because Warfighters, I've got your six.